Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Assalatu wassalamu ala anbiya'il mursalin. Allahumma salli ala sayidina Muhammad wa fatihi ma khuliq wal khatimi ma sabaq. Nasallu ala haqqi haqq wa hadil siratal mustaqim wa ala alihi haqqul azim. Alhamdulillah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh everyone wherever you are. May peace be upon you. We pray that you are in good health in, and good iman and well being. Uh, welcome to another night of sa ilahi and also podcast. And tonight we have uh, three special guests, three blessed people that I know in my life, and we're gonna talk about uh, Sheikh Ahmad Tijani and the Tijani Sufi Order. So let us welcome our three guests. While we're waiting for another one, uh, Sidi Talud, we welcome first uh, Sheikh Zakir Wright and uh, Sidi Ibrahim Dinsum. Mashallah. So uh, Sheikh Zakir Wright uh, wrote. Uh, wrote a lot of books actually uh he's uh mashallah and uh cd ibrahim dinson is the founder of faida books and he also had published uh quite number of uh tarikat tijania books mashallah may allah preserve them and uh i first know she exactly write through his book on the path of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and that book actually changed uh my not only mine but also my wife and my life and how we see tariqa how we see sufi order and recently also he has came out with a new book called realizing islam and about the journey in the uh, north africa experience so assalamualaikum uh, shay zakri how are you wa well, alaikum assalam alhamdulillah it's an honor to be with you sidi khaled honor to see you uh, sidi ibrahim inshallah Welcome to our program and our podcast. So, uh, Sheikh, the first question I'd like to ask you uh, about this uh, realizing Islam: How different it is uh, from the book that you had written on the path of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Yeah. So, you know, as you know, um, the first book on the path of the Prophet was uh, my master's thesis that I wrote in 2003. Um, and I, you know, I stand by it being a good um, introduction um, to the to the primary source material, um, and you know, kind of an introduction to the biography. Hello, Imam. Hello, how are you? Assalamualaikum. Wassalam. Hello, welcome. Mashallah. Um, so I'm just Hello. answering the question about um, how the book realizing Islam is different than the first book, um, in the Prophet. Um, And yeah, and so the answer is that they're, um, of course, about the, a similar subject. Mm-hmm. Um, but in reality, this book is much deeper um, in, prim- in uh, delving into the primary sources, also looking at a wider range of secondary source material. There's been a lot of new research done um, on the 18th century um, since I wrote my MA thesis that I wanted to kind of um, respond to and um, situate the Tijania within that broader intellectual context. And there's also been a lot of new publications um, in Arabic of Tijani mm-hmm. primary source material. Um, and so successive trips um, to Morocco have really been able to allow me to kind of put that together. Also had access to um, sources external to the Tijania that speak about um, Sheikh Hamar Tijani and 18th century intellectual developments in Morocco that I uh, didn't look at previously, like uh, Salawat uh, Al-Anfas by uh, Sidi Jafar al-Qatani, uh, very important sources about what was going on in Morocco in that time. Um, so, and, and that uh, also coupled with, um, yeah, so new, new publications in Arabic, um, uh, new ability, frankly, for me to look at those sources also Um, Arabic's got a bit stronger since, um, you know, almost 20 years ago. Um, and um, yeah, new publications uh, in 18th century, but also new manuscript sources, stuff that's been unpublished that I think really is important um, to speak to the maqam or the spiritual station of Shah Majani. As you know, the Jawah Rumani is essential, but um, it doesn't um, really elaborate on the maqam of Sheikh Majani as Qutb al-Maktoum um, because that was a, a maqam technically that he received after the uh, completion of Juwahir al-Mani. Um, and, uh, and although other 
um, writers like uh, Sidi Arabi ibn Sa'i in the Bulyat al Mustafi does elaborate on that subject. And Shay Rahim, of course, does too. There are other manuscript sources that do talk about um, what that. Uh, it firsthand accounts of of that that was that were written during Sheikh Almanjani's own life. So I wanted I took permission from Sheikh Tijani Sisi to put some um, of those passages in in the new book. So that's where it stands. I, I was, frankly, there's no comparison between the old and the new books um, from my own perspective. I mean, I think the first one is still a good introduction, but it um, it, it 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 deserved a, a follow up. Yeah, uh, thank you, Shay. Uh, there's some questions from the audience. I think, mashallah, tonight we have a uh, quite a huge number of people watch, viewing it. So I think Shay or Sidi Imam Talud or Sidi Ibrahim would like to share also about the biography of Shay Ahmad Tijani, a new introduction to all those people watching, and they want they would like to know uh, more about him. Maybe. Uh, one of you, or maybe Sheikh, we can start with Sheikh Zakri right first, and then the rest can continue with his biography, life, and contribution first. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, first, I mean, I, I got to send my shout outs to Sidi Ibrahim and, and to you, Khaled. I didn't get a chance to properly greet Imam Talud okay. and his work on um, the translation of the Jawahir Mani. Really honored to be um, uh, discussing this with him. I, I look forward to hearing what he has to say. Um, of course, this is the most important primary source about um, uh, the life of Shah Amr yeah. um, So, in terms of the, you know, the biography that I can speak to as a, you know, I'm trained as a historian, like an intellectual historian, um, and I wanted to do a, a couple of things with with my new book, um, and you know, so so one was to sort of. Um, look into the references in the Juwahir al-Mani and other, like the Kitab al-Jami and other places where Shah Amr mentions different people that he met. And I wanted to be able to explore and nail down who those people were, uh, what kind of intellectual currents were they connected to. Um, uh, and then I, I also, because I'm trained more as an African historian, mm -hmm. uh, and of course the Tijaniya is, um, you know, uh, one, um, one out of every four Muslims in the world are on the African continent. Um, uh, the majority, according to the Pew Research polls, et cetera, of, of Muslims in Africa practice a form of Sufism. Uh, and by far the largest Sufi order on the African continent is the Tijaniya. So the Tijaniya is very important, a very important window into African uh, intellectual contributions. Um, and I felt that um, there wasn't a, a, a proper understanding in, in prior academic research about how the Tijaniya spread into sub-Saharan so-called Black Africa, right? It's sort of like, well, um, I, I felt like the, the previous understanding was that, well, the Tijaniya is a specifically heterodox Sufi order and Black African Muslims are not real Muslims anyway. So of course they adopted the Tijaniya. I really wanted to, you know, tear apart that argument. Um, and one of the ways I wanted to do that was to look at the, the sort of intellectual trends within West Africa in particular that were, that predated and were right around the same time as the emergence of the Tijaniya and talk about how they had um, scholars in Timbuktu and other places that actually prefigured or had thought about a lot of the same ideas mm -hmm. that the Tijaniya were we're speaking about. And one of the most interesting connections I found, for example, was that, you know, the, the, the sort of pearl of the Tijani litanies is this prayer called Salat al Fati that you opened this session with. Um, this was uh, the, uh, the result of the spiritual um, inspiration of a sheikh in Egypt named Muhammad al Bakri, who dies in 1585. Uh, and he had a relationship with the scholars of Timbuktu. They used to call him the Qutb, and, 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 and in the Timbuktu Chronicles, he appears actually in Timbuktu, in some of the mosques. And so we don't know whether he traveled by spiritually or actually went there. Um, but they don't talk about Salat al-Fati. So that the idea then that the Tijaniya has Muhammad al-Bakri's most important secret, mm -hmm. um, and then and, 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 and sort of brings it into West Africa, where people would already have been made aware of how important Muhammad al-Bakri was, for example, and, and, 
And, and so they would have felt, you know, they would have felt themselves part of a conversation that they had started long ago. And not to mention there are things called like the Tariqa Mahmoudiya, uh, very similar iterations to the Tariqa Muhammadiya that are in West Africa from, you know, from the late um, uh, 16th and early 17th centuries. Um, and so in, in that way, this idea of combining, you know, very orthodox practice of the Sharia with a form of Sufism, a Mohammedan Sufism that's connected to the person of the Prophet. This was the way that West Africans understood um, their religious identity, large, you know, in, in, in a more broad fashion, but in more particular terms and how they understood the practice of the Sawaf or of Sufism. And so um, the Tijaniya really, really resonated with those ideas that were already there in West Africa. Um, and so you know, just very quickly, there are other kind of intellectual traditions that I'm connecting uh, the Tijaniya to. Um, this is through the, the primary source material that um, Imam Talud has, has translated in, in others. But you know, the, the, the school of Ibrahim Qurani um, established in the Hijaz. Um, and so the initiators like Muhammad Saman um, uh, that Shaykh Mahjani met in Medina Manawara, uh, he was a part of this school. So what's interesting is that he was a student of Muhammad Hayat al-Sindi, who was a Hadith scholar and a Naqshbandi Sufi. Muhammad Hayat al-Sindi was also the teacher of Muhammad, Abu Dwa, uh, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, right? Um, <laughs> but Muhammad Hayat al-Sindi had connections back to Ibrahim Qurani. Um, and so one of the things that Ibrahim Qurani is doing is really defending Ibn Arabi, defending the idea of Wahdat al-Wujud. And I thought that was important because there are some people mistakenly think that, you know, the Tijaniya is a sort of retreat from the theosophic Sufism of Ibn Arabi. And they even go so far as to say, well, the, the Tijaniya doesn't, you know, has tended away from Wahdat al-Wujud, the kind of idea of oneness of being. That's not, that's not the case, right? Very much part of this tradition of Ibrahim Qurani. Um, and so then there's, of course, the uh, traditions of Indian Sufism coming out of Muhammad al gawth and the Shatariya uh, Sufi order, um, particularly through the book, The, the Five Pearls, the Jawahir al khams that Shah Marjani is getting initiation in and is actually writing, you know, copying in his own hand um, uh, portions of that book. And, and then there are, you know, are other, um, of course, the, the the Shazali traditions of North Africa that were there before. Shah Mujani had close connections with them. Uh, and of course, the Khalwatiya Sufi order that um, had seen, it comes out of Turkey originally, but um, uh, has seen a revival or led a revival um, of, of Sufism and, and Islamic orthodoxy in, uh, in, in Syria and in, and in Egypt during the period. So this really connects Sheikh Ahmed from India to West Africa to um, uh, to, to, to Syria, Turkey, to, to, to Egypt, um, to the formative, most vibrant intellectual revivals of their time. And I think that was important for, it's, it's not, you know, the story of the Tijaniya is not just that Shah Mahjani saw the prophet, say, said him, out of nowhere, and then got the Tariqa. And so that, you know, by, by extension, not that anybody who sees the prophet <laughs> is, is just like Shah Mahjani. No, right? He was a, he was a, renowned scholar connected with the most vibrant traditions of his time and he had very close Sheikh disciple relations with many of the great scholars of, of the period uh, and so when he emerges as a he had already come emerged as as a Sheikh of the Khalwatiya right in North Africa before he um, is instructed by the prophet system to, to start his own tariqa. but uh, so that's the kind of story that I wanted to tell in the beginning of that of that book Inshallah. Uh, Imam Talud, uh, Inshallah, nice to have you in again. Inshallah, we miss you because last week we were sick. Shafakallah. And uh, in regards to the Tariqa Tijani, and uh, you know, a lot of people always question about the conditions that you can visit other scenes and all that. Perhaps you like to share the light of the reality of the path itself and why it is in such a manner and why is it important because the path itself is Tarbiya and so on. Yeah. Imam. So, uh, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, um, the, the conditions of the Tariqa Tijaniya are not, uh, they, they seem strange in our time. And that is because uh, a lot of Tasawwuf, um, a lot of later Tasawwuf 
took on a, a sort of uh, tabarruk kind of uh, uh, feel where it was um, mostly you were taking, you know, awrad and you were taking things for, for baraka of the different shiyukh and um, a, a lot of uh, initiation into, into tasawwuf um, in later times didn't involve uh, tarabiyah. And so uh, one of the things that, that uh, the Tijaniya, uh, that, that Sheikh Ahmed Tijani, who um, revived, you know, by, by, you know, command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is that his tariqah, no matter what, why you take it, you know, your, his tariqah has conditions because his tariqah, his, his awrad, you know, they contain, you know, the basis of tarabiyah in his path. And so um, these strict these conditions that some people find to be too strict, uh, they come from a, a point of view that you are entering this tariqa to travel the path, to receive tarabiya, and to enter the, the the divine presence and the presence of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is there's no other reason for you to be taking this tariqa. And so if that is the case, um, and you really want to enter into the divine presence then there's no need for you to look anywhere else. And so um, the the condition, especially what people have um, with the ziyara, with not being able to visit, you know, different awliya, um, living in uh, or, you know, passed on, uh, they have problems with this because they don't understand that this is, this is a way that Sheikh Ahmed Zijani who is instilling the main principle of traveling in the path and his students, and that is Sidq. You know, Sidq is that you, in, in terms of, of Tasawwuf, uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Ibrahim Niyasa he, he defines Sidq as having one direction in the path. You have one direction in the path. And so how do you do this? You make your Sheikh one. And, you know, just like you made your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one. And if your Shaykh is one and your Prophet is one, and then, you know, you're, then, you know, the path is straight. If you have different shayukh and they all connect to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you have a longer and, and very, you know, um, sometimes even perilous path. And so um, this was part of one of the reasons that Ziyara was, is, is you know, a strictly, Forbidden, you know, in this in this uh, in this path, Be, not is 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 not you know disrespect, of course, you know, because the sheikh, you know, he would always mention after that he would always mention uh, ma tiram, you know, with uh, respect and veneration for all of the the, the awliya. It's not and love and veneration for all of the awliya, you know, whether they're in this tariqah or not. You know, so the visit, the, the 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 prohibition of visitation has nothing to do with you know whether or not one venerates the the awliya. It's more to do with uh, the fact that you see your door to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Sheikh Ahmed Tijani radiallahu anhu, and no one else. And this is uh you know, this is also mentioned in in the works of uh, Sidi Abdul Aziz al Dabad. Uh, who is not Tijani, you know, who says that you will not, you know, you will not know Allah until you become extinguished in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you will not become extinguished in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until you become extinguished in your sheikh. And you will not become, uh, you will not become extinguished in your sheikh until you pray the funeral prayer over, over all of creation. And that doesn't mean that you you literally see them as dead. It means that for all of your your spiritual benefit, you go to your sheikh and your sheikh alone. You know, and you you venerate you know the people that deserve veneration. But for you, your sheikh is your door, and that's who you're going to for your for your spiritual benefit. And it doesn't really um, it doesn't entail. You know what people accuse people of of, of disrespecting the awliya. It doesn't entail that, you know. And uh, even uh, you know, Sheikh Ahmed Zijani anhu, he said that you know um, that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to him, you know, there is something that the sheikhs, there's a matter that the sheikhs have neglected, 
in their path and by and because of their neglecting it you know that many of their movies have gone astray and that is that if one somebody knows one sheikh and visits another then he will not benefit from either of them and what he means is that if somebody gives bayah to a sheikh and is completely is in his path and, and is on his path and then goes and visits someone else you know another sheikh who has another path you know for benefit then you know it will cancel his benefit from his sheikh and he will not benefit from the other sheikh you know and so these these are principles that were laid down you know in in the from early on um but they were abandoned you know at, at, at certain times and and part of the reason that they were abandoned was was because there were there was corruption among some of the uh the the people who pretended to be sheikhs and they would enslave basically enslave their murids take all of their money take all of their uh, you know um all of their possessions and then make them in service to them um and so some some uh some reformers in their path they abolished you know certain rules uh regarding the sheikh um in order to combat that uh but you know it was the these things when when people come and they reform certain things then they are are um they're restricted to that time and that circumstance and so it doesn't it, it it wasn't supposed to be a universal rule but it became a universal rule just like uh the declaration of uh, abu Abbas al hadrami the sheikh of, of uh zaruk who said that um, the training by the traditional methods of the Sufis has has been has ceased, um, and he said that, and he and he gave certain um, principles for for his path that uh, uh, Sidi Zarouk he transmits, and and at the the conclusion of his uh, Qawaid at the 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 principles of the uh, but that wasn't supposed to be a universal rule. That was for his time and in his circumstance. And if the cer if certain circumstances or certain times are uh, you know are equal to what was going on in his time, then yes, you know then then you can apply it. But um, it doesn't mean that all tarabi is cut off. So when these principles are suspended by by certain shuyuk in their path, you know Sheikh Sheikh uh, Al Arabi ibn Sayyid. Um, he and uh, Bugyatul Mustafid in the beginning, uh, he quotes from different shayukh who say that, you know, the, the sheikhs in their path, may, meaning the sheikhs who ha are the grand sheikhs of the Turuq, they are, their position in their path is like the position of the, the mujtahids and, and the madahid, and the mujtahids in the schools of law. That is that they extract you know what they, they extract the rulings of their path that are beneficial for their murids that doesn't mean that they cancel the uh the rulings of of the path of other people's path that is beneficial for their murids that's not what that means you know just as you know uh imam abu hanifa ruling that of you know below the navel is sunnah doesn't cancel Imam Malik's ruling that sad, uh, of Saddam. You know, they, 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 they're they two mujtahids who have extracted from the Quran and Sunnah those rulings. The same way the shuyukh, they find, you know, in the in the spiritual training of the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of the companions and the spiritual guidance of the Quran, they find certain principles and they apply certain principles in their path that are beneficial for their murids. And so when you, um, when people come and they apply, you know, they say, okay, so strict visitation or strict prohibition of visitation isn't necessary anymore. That's for their murids, you know, and the, the, the people that branch off from that path, but it doesn't apply universally. And so the, the universal principle of, of, of not visiting other than your sheikh remains for anyone who wants to apply it. And so Sheikh Ahmed Tijani who was not applying anything new, he was actually applying the old rule, you know, that you stick with your Sheikh until you get all of what he has for you. And in terms of the Tijaniya, you know, um, 
Sheikh Ahmed Sijani is, is the, the Khatam al Awliya, and he's the Qutb al Maktoum, he's the seal of the saints, and he's the hidden pole. And that, and that means that, you know, there's no end to what our Sheikh has for us. So there's no need, you know, there, there's nothing over the, the Khatam al Awliya except for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If that is the, 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 uh, the case, then there's no need for you to go anywhere else. You have Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you have the Qutb al-Maktum. And so if you enter into the Ahad, if you enter into the covenant of the Qutb al-Maktum, then you have no need of going to anyone else. And if you are looking anywhere else for your spiritual guidance, then this is a sign that you need to correct your intention upon entering the path. You know, so that that's the and and the other conditions. You know, they they have the same uh, sticking to the 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 weird. You know, that that's the ad of every sheikh. You know, having to do the weird. You know, in the morning and evening, that's the ad of every sheikh. You can't enter a path without <laughs> without doing that. Um, having to do the awrad until until death. This is the same as the 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 uh, condition of uh, of visitation. You know, and these are just the conditions to enter the path. You know, we have many more conditions that one has to to uh, try and apply in his life in order to to really perfect his his uh, his traveling of the Tijani path. You know, um, and but uh, you know the the one of the things that I, I had wanted to mention or, or comment on from uh, what Sidi uh, Zakaria was saying um, is that. Um, when we read, you know, we're reading the, the primary sources, and actually, you know, um, because Jawahar al Ma'ani um, is a book that, that gathers together a lot of different uh, sources, you know, I've had to actually, you know, read different sources and things like that. And, uh, you know, one of the things that is apparent when you're reading the book, you know, first of all, his, his student is not a scholar by any means. Uh, Sidi uh, Ali Harazm was not a scholar. Um, he was a person who, you know, he had a little bit of, of, uh, of reading um, and uh, in the, the books of, of uh, Sharia, and he fell in love with the, the works of the, the, the Sufis. And when he found Sheikh Ahmed Dijani, who he completely dedicated himself to him, and this is before Sheikh Ahmed Dijani, who had the, the, uh, the path uh, from Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was Khalwati when he when he met uh, Sidi Ali Harazm, and then when Sheikh Ahmed Dijani who received his path, he entered his path without without fail. And so this the the Jawad al Maani is, is compiled by a a non scholar, you know. Yet it references you know many scholarly works, you know. And Sheikh and, and Sheikh Ahmed Dijani who you know the the fact that you know all of the people mentioned and he's asked about them. Uh, and what they said, and and he gives clear and and methodical answers on what they meant, and what they um, and, and uh, what what the different uh, the different uh, intellectual uh, currents said about certain verses of the Quran, what the different intellectual currents said about certain hadith, and he was keenly aware of all of that. Is a is a very um, is a, is a very clear sign that he was one of, one of the eminent scholars of his time. There's like if you read Jawad al Maani and you you uh, you read with a, a clear mind and you see that he's referencing he's referencing the uh, you know the the Maturidis, you know, and their positions. How do you reference the Maturidis? You know, if you're not a scholar in that time and you live in, in North Africa, which is like predominantly Ashari, you know, they don't, you know, and they don't, you know, the, the references to the Maturidi, you know, tradition and the, and the West African Ashari tradition isn't really, you know, they, they, they don't, you know, it isn't a fair assessment, but Sheikh Ahmed Zijani really know, one who gives a clear assessment of what they're saying and you know, and so so this this um, this clearly sh shows that he was a studied person. He was a person who had a wide range of knowledge. And um, you know, this is this goes back to something that you know I said you know a few years ago after uh, completing the, the the translation, and you know I I was moving on to um, a, a different translation. 
you know, when you see, you know, you read the, the, the works, you know, on or works by, you know, these different shiyukh, you know, you get a an idea of people who were, you know, they were completely immersed in the Islamic tradition, but they were keenly aware of their time and the needs of their time. And so, you know, that's what that's what makes, you know, um, the Tijaniya such a, a uh, a wonderful path for our time is that the sheikh was keenly aware of his time and what and the needs of people who would come after him. And so his path only incorporates what they need. And his path excludes things, you know, that would have would have become a hindrance for, for people these days, uh, for the, the ziyara. <laughs> the ziyara of different awliya, you know, has become a fitna in our time. You know where you know the, the there's so much fitna going on between you know different Sufi orders and things like this, and you know to a large extent, you know the the followers of Sheikh Ahmed Tijani, Rabbi you know, who are, are excluded from this. You know we have our own problems, but but you know we're excluded from a lot of the the larger fitness that go on because we don't you know we don't meddle you know and it, and so for for to some extent. You know, Sheikh Ahmed Tijani, you know, one who has has uh, has set down principles in his path that have saved you know his his students from a lot of the the fitna that is going on, and the fitna to come you know in the last days. Mashallah, beautiful you said. Thank you, uh, Imam Talud. And then uh, we also have another blessed guest, uh, Sidi Ibrahim Dimsum, uh, from Atlanta, but right now he's in uh, Senegal. Mashallah, how are you, Sidi, over there? We're doing very well, alhamdulillah. So now I'd like come to all of the esteemed panelists, uh, to you, Sidi yes. Khalid, uh, and uh, everyone that's, uh, yeah. that's a view of this. How the atmosphere there? You know, we recently lost uh, the Khalifa, Sheikh Ahmad Tijani Nias, and also his mm -hmm. brothers, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Were you there during the uh, Salat Janazah and so on? I was. I was for each of those. Um, prior to that loss, we also lost our our grandmother, Sayyida Yafatu. Yes, yeah, yeah. the mother of Sheikh yeah. Hassan, the daughter of Sheikh Ibrahim and Imam Sheikh, the uh, mother of Sheikh Imam Sheikh and mm. Sheikh Mani Sisa. So it's been a difficult time this past 30, 45 days. Mm -hmm. uh, Sidi, is... Uh... Really interesting. Uh, thanks to you, uh, the Fida books that you publish, uh, uh, some of the work of Sheikh Ibrahim Nias, and also recently, congratulations on the uh, release of the Jawi Ma'ani, working with Sidi, uh, Imam Talud. Uh, and we, have, we, have, we read before about your story on the Tariqa and so on. So, what inspired you to start the Fida books and what can we learn from your experience even on the tariqa as a as a person or in, in your journey itself yeah mm -hmm. well you know what inspired me initially um, to start for the books and i actually remember a conversation i had with professor zakaria when i was making the intention almost eight years ago um what actually inspired me had very little to do with Tariqa. Uh, the inspiration came from the fact that throughout my life, uh, the only literature that was very, very much available and prevalent in the Muslim communities um, were literature that was being promulgated by our brothers on the Salafi Wahhabi side. Um, and for that reason, it was a great deal of misunderstanding, uh, lack of knowledge with regards to Tasawwuf, Sufism, um, and that disturbed me quite a bit for most of my teenage years and on into university. And I tried to understand why that was. And, and, I, and I quickly realized you had one group subsidized by Saudi Petrodollars, and they were able to publish and translate and get a great deal of their works out by some of their scholars of old, uh, like Ibn Taymiyyah. And then 
uh, explained by the more contemporary, the more contemporary scholars of Sheikh bin Baz and Ibn Uthaymin and so forth and so on. Um, and I always desired to create a way with which the literature of the Tariqa Tijaniya and also uh, the specific literature of Sheikh Ibrahim and Yas and, and the scholars uh, within the community of the Feda, I've always desired to, to translate and bring their works to the forefront. Alhamdulillah, with the passage of time, technology has made it much easier. Uh, social media has made it very, very uh, easy to basically um, uh, compete on a more level ground with the publishing companies that have much more uh, larger budgets and, and just, uh, just uh, behemoths in the Islamic book sphere. Um, so what we did was we, we spoke with Sidi Zakaria. And, and prior to that, I would like to say one of the inspirations I can say, uh, can you hear me well? Okay, so one of the inspirations I can say was actually you, Sidi Khaled, with uh, the book you published, Islam, the Religion of Peace, um, a book of, uh, of, of, that you published for Imam Sheikh Tijani Sisi. Um, that was actually one of the main catalysts that made me realize that this is doable. Um, so I wanted to thank you uh, yeah. formally for, for doing that. And the work of Sutilahi is, uh, is absolutely amazing. Um, and then we had the Ruhul Adab that uh, our beloved Sheikh Hassan Sise uh, translated many, many years ago and was uh, published initially by the AAII. Um, and we looked at the Kashful al Bas, which was translated by Sidi Zakaria and a team of scholars. And I realized quickly that this is something that's actually possible. Uh, we consulted with Sidi Zakaria. We sought the permission from Imam Sheikh Tijani Sise, and and Wallahi, um, it's been a miracle. Every publication is miraculous. Um, everyone who puts their hand into translating, um, and I've been working over the past few years very closely with Sidi Talu, and with several translations. The more later, the latest translation being the first volume of the Jawahir. Um, every translator from Sidi Zakaria to Sidi Talut have been absolutely amazing to work with. Um, they understand the mission. Um, this is not something that we're ever probably never going to become wealthy from, but it, it wasn't a matter of wealth. It was a matter of doing a service to the Muslim community in general and specifically assisting the Tijani community, particularly with regards to literature. In, in, in the English language and Faded Books hopes to, it's very soon and actually before the end of the year, transition into uh, areas where the literature will become more available and the original sources of Arabic also were translated English and in French and inshallah mm -hmm. with the assistance of Sidi Talu in Spanish. So. These are some of our motivations. We ask for all of you to keep praying for us and supporting us. And we appreciate everyone. Inshallah, we fully share Sidi Ibrahim. May Allah preserve you in all the works that you have done. And I think there's so many people uh, who are like me who are benefiting from the books. Inshallah. I'm uh, going back to uh, she exactly right. right. Uh, she, you know, that there, there's always a saying about this Tariqa Muhammadiyah and the history of Tariqa Muhammadiyah are mainly in the North Africa. Uh, they say that it's Egypt, uh, Tunisia, Morocco, and Algeria, and all that. So, uh, is uh, Tariqa Tijani considered as part of it? Or is there such a thing as Tariqa Muhammadiyah? So how how does this sort of link and uh, connected, or it is not? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one of the debates that um, academic researchers are having right now about the 18th century 
is a, about local context versus, um, um, you know, like I guess schools of thought, right? Yeah. Um, and so um, on the one hand, you have people like John Vole who have uh, earlier on kind of postulated about um, a, a world, a kind of global fascination with Hadith study in Ijtihad and these kinds of things um, during the 18th century. Uh, and, and in that conversation, you can find a fixed conversations about Tariqa Muhammadiyya. And I think that's where you find kind of my, my first book on the path of the prophet kind of weighing in on that and saying, yeah, there was this um, worldwide um, uh, conversation about Tariqa Muhammadiyya and, and the Tijaniya was very much a part of that. Um, and then on the other hand, you have people like Ahmed Dalal, um, who's a dean here at um, Georgetown in Qatar, um, who wrote a really great book called um, Islam Without Europe. And, and he really concentrates on people like Muhammad Shawkani and Muhammad Sunusi in Yemen and uh, North Africa, respectively. And he's arguing more for, you know, that, that these were really um, incredible intellectuals. Um, uh, they saw themselves as the intellectual peers of people like Al-Ghazali and others, the greatest scholars of the Islamic past. So that, therefore, the 18th century was not a period of intellectual stagnation and decline, but rather one of vibrancy. Um, but that what they were primarily um, interested in uh, was getting the Islamic traditions to speak to their local constituencies. And I, I heard um, uh, Imam Dalud saying a similar thing. And so I, this more, my more recent research has kind of tried to situate it in between these two polarities. And I think um, the end of the day, yes, there is a discussion about Tariqa Muhammadiyya from the late 17th century into the 18th century, um, but it means different things for different people. And the idea that there's somehow this sort of um, uh, corporate organization called the Tariqa Muhammadiyya of which the Tijaniya is one offshoot is um, patently false, right? Um, so yes, there, you know, um, people like Murtada Zabidi are talking about Tariqa Muhammadiyya and people like Nasr Andalib uh, the father of uh, Mir Dard in India are talking about Tariqa Muhammadiyya. Um, uh, even the earlier Jezulia uh, in, in, um, in, in Morocco and, uh, is also talking about Tariqa Muhammadiyya. Um, but that doesn't mean that they were all, you know, uh, thought about the idea in the same, in the same way. Um, and so the Tijaniya, prim uh, the primary sources of the Tijaniya do talk about what the Tijani perspective of Tariqa Muhammadiyya is, and I think um, in ideological terms, it essentially means that the real sheikh of the Tijaniya is the Prophet Muhammad, you know, and that Shaykh Muhammad is the Muqaddam, right, is the, the propagator lieutenant who, who, um, who kind of popularizes this uh, uh, Sufi order of the Prophet Muhammad, um, and, pract and practically it means that the fundamental um, practice of the Tijaniya is uh, Salat al nabi prayer upon the Prophet. And so in, in that way, I mean, there are some similarities, right? Some of the followers of Ahmed ibn Idris said similar things, but the idea that this is actually the same Tariqa, I think is erroneous. Inshallah, thank you, Shay. Uh, um, so so th this debate uh, about whether there is a Tariqa Muhammadiyya and what it is. And, and uh, th this has actually been going on since, you know, people started speaking of uh, Tariqa Muhammadiyya. And uh, uh, Sidi Al-Arabi bin Sai, he actually addresses it in, uh, in Bulgit al um in the section, the section on um, the, the different names of the Tariqa Tijaniya and the section on it become, being called Muhammadiyya. He addresses that and um, he addresses people that say, well, there's no Tariqa Muhammadiyya. And, you know, he, he basically says what Sidi Zakaria said, you know, that it's not an organized, you know, this is, a, this is a Tariqa and organized and it has different offshoots, but it has um, key principles. And so among the principles that he mentioned, you know, are, you know, that the, uh, um, are the two things that Sidi Zakaria mentioned as the the um the tijani definition is you know the focus 
on Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam as the source and as the sheikh, and um, the focus on um, Salat al Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he he uh, actually quotes a few different shayukh who have uh, es espoused this idea of Tariqah Muhammadiyah, you know, and um, that they their path is to you know follow the Quran and the Sunnah. To you know, and to make copious amounts of salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam until we meet him in our dreams and in our in our wakeful state, you know. And so this this is you know um, they they as far as being an an organized order in the in terms of how we view you know turuk you know then then this is act, act, like he said it's it's false, um, and this is the same conclusion that um, you get from Bugita Mustafid. But there are key principles that unite all of the all of these different orders, and that these orders um, that that are called Muhammadan or Muhammadiyah, they they all stick to, and and uh, I think you you can find those principles in in all of them. You know, I'm the guy. I just wanted to to add that. Yeah, I think it's a good discussion. I think what you're describing is sort of like a methodology, right? That's yeah. that's pretty common. Um, but you know, still, I think like we have to. You know, we have to kind of go down to the lowest common denominator because if we start talking, I mean, you, granted, as you you spoke about um, very coherently, the the Tijaniya has um, a, a pretty um, traditional understanding of Sheikh disciple relations, right? Um, and so, other Tariqa Muhammadiyya movements like the followers of Sidi Ahmed Emil Idris have a very different understanding of, of Sheikh Disciple. They don't call, they, uh, Ahmed Ibn Idris only like to be called Ustaz. And, um, yeah. and you know, for that matter, the Tariqa Muhammadiyya, I find this is an interesting coincidence, you know, that Hassan Ibn Amin Talib appears to Nasr Andalib right around the same year that Sheikh Amajani was born and says, mm -hmm. I'm giving you the Tariqa Muhammadiyya. And that's the first kind of like uh, direct transmission that even though Tariqa Muhammadiyah was used um, as an in, in terminology ways earlier, this is the first instance that I know publicly where the where through kind of initiatory ru'ya that somebody gets the Tariqa, something yes. called the Tariqa Muhammadiyah in this way. Um, uh, and, and you know, even as and as this methodology later on develops out of India, Mirudar is uh, very much interested in poetry as a, as a methodology of connecting um so i you know i think i think that the general point is is this difficult to sustain the idea that um as yeah. you were saying that this is one you know kind of corporate organization that everybody thinks the same but there are kind of foundational principles uh, or methodologies i think is a good word um that describe what this is yeah and umar futital is actually predated i think uh even even say in, in talking yeah. about what Tariqa Muhammadiyah actually means, yeah. Uh, Shri Zakaria, just uh, holding on to you uh, to continue. Um, in in as how is it that the Tariqa, you know, when Shamat Tijani, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, when he passed on, that he was buried in Morocco first, but the Tariqa is like what you mentioned as a strong spread connection and link to the uh, entire Africa, especially the West Africa, right? So how, how can we learn that history that how it goes about and it's like an ocean, it's like a waves and we know Shea Brahmi has sort of revived it and bring it more towards to, to the African and also to the humanity, yeah. That's a really good question. I think, well, one of the misnomers is, is that the Tijaniya is only, a, a, in parentheses, Black African Sufi order, right? Um, the fact is that up until the 1930s, the Tijaniya was the most popular Sufi order in Morocco, and this is attested by French um, ethnographers. Um, and, you know, this is counting the Shazaliya not as one order, but different, or like the Darqawiya is a different order. Um, but it basically meant that in every city in Morocco, um, uh, up until 1930s or 40s, there was a Zawiya. Um, and, um, and one of the arguments I make in the book is that actually prior, there's also been a mistaken understanding that it's only because of Mole Suleiman, the Sultan of Morocco, um, his support for the Tijaniya, that it gets established in Morocco. And if it wasn't for Mole Suleiman, 
um, then the Tigenia would have sort of faded out. Um, the reality is, is that Sheikh Amajani already had a very large following in Algeria. Um, and, uh, uh, and it wasn't just, you know, people from the oases. They were major scholars from urban areas um, and very wealthy people. Um, like see the Adi Tamasini in the east of, of Algeria. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the primary motors then, of course, is these Shinkiti scholars. Um, and the, the thing to know about the Shinkiti scholars is that they were, um, so Abdurrahman Shinkiti um, uh, was a scholar who died right, uh, say, I think in like 1807. Um, so kind of before Shaykh Mahjani, but he was living and teaching in Fes, and he was known to be the greatest scholar in Fes. And so any of you know, if you've been to Fes, you know Bab Bujalud, yeah. that mosque right outside Bab Bujalud. Abdurrahman al-Shankid used to teach in that mosque. Um, and he had all of the ulama of Fes gathered with him, at, um, at studying with him. And at one time, Shaykh Mahjani, when he first arrives in Fes, he goes to pray in the mosque. He makes two rakahs to greet the mosque. Um, and then uh, as soon as Shaykh Amajani finishes, Abdurrahman Shankiti leaves his majlis of his, of his students and goes to sit with Shaykh Amajani. And then later his, the, the students are kind of upset. They say, you know, we're only with you because we think you're the, there's nobody that has the same type of knowledge that you do um, here, you know. And, 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 and Abdurrahman Shankiti says, by Allah, there's nobody on the face of the earth with more knowledge than that man that's just come in from the desert. No. No. Um, so this goes to, to show then that these um, Shinkiti scholars were very important for attesting to the scholarship of Shaykh Amr And of course, um, not only through um, the Western Shinkiti, but also through the desert oases like Tuat that was on the Trans-Saharan Trans caravan route. So that was a bit further to the east. These would have been avenues for uh, expansion or proselytization of the Tijinia, uh south of the Sahara. Um, so, um, so, but, but really, I think one of the other um, impediments to our understanding is to recognize that the Sahara Desert is not an impenetrable desert, right? That this was actually a zone of exchange. Um, and, uh, and so that West African scholars of, of Timbuktu, um, et cetera, shared much with their Moroccan and Algerian counterparts and were exchanging books and scholars. And, in and, you know, but never actually saw themselves as inferior, whether well, it wasn't a racial thing, right? I mean, some of the scholars of Timbuktu really criticized the scholars of, of, of Morocco for being dogmatically attached to the Maliki Madhab, for example, even though the scholars of Timbuktu were also Maliki, but they thought that the Moroccans were too dogmatically attached. Um, so, uh, uh, and so this was a shared zone of exchange. So although Sheikh Amajani didn't have any direct contact, right? I mean, he did go to Tuat quite often. Um, uh, he didn't have any direct contact um, with a, a black African scholar that I, that I could find in the primary sources. And that's dissimilar to, the, the, to somebody like Sidi Abdulaziz Dabag that Imam Talut mentioned, right? That Dabag uh, really gets his, uh, you know, I think his primary initiation, one could argue, from the Sheikh Bernawi who appears in Fez and initiates him and basically says, now that I've put you in the presence of the prophet, say Salaam, I no longer have fear for you, so I'm going back to my own country. Um, and so you could, you know, this is also evidence then that there's been this exchange, right, um, between Sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and Morocco for, for generations prior to Sheikh Ahmed Dijani, and that this was sort of a natural, this would have been a natural conclusion, right? If, so, if something, a, a major intellectual event happens in Morocco, scholars in West Africa would know about it right away, right? And they'd be interested in it. And one of the reasons, I, as I mentioned previously, that they're interested in it is because Sheikh Ahmed Dijani is saying many of the same things that they've already said, right? Um, he's talking about respect for the Maliki school. He says, this is our school. Um, but he is emphasizing the, the capacity for continued ijtihad uh, within the school. That's something that the, the West, the t scholars of Timbuktu, the scholars of West Africa also said in, in, in contradistinction to the scholars of, of, of Morocco. Um, he's, he's talking about this Mohammedan Sufism, which they're also very interested in, right? Um, and, you know, arguably there's, yeah, 
the Qadri and the Tijaniya for all practical purposes really appear in West Africa right around the same time with Mukhtar Kunti and this, this idea that the Qadriya is brought to West Africa with Abdul Karim Magili um, in the, in the, I think the uh, 15th or 16th centuries is, uh, I think most historians have proved is, is basically historical imagination. Um, but um, because a Magili is, is ignored by the scholars of Timbuktu during his own time, actually, it's not, it's thought to be a joke um, or a psychophant, but, um, uh, uh, but so there, there's this, um, you know, basically the 18th century uh, is a time that it's not that Sufism didn't exist in West Africa prior to the 18th century. It's arguably that these scholars of Timbuktu and elsewhere felt themselves, no, uh, they didn't feel themselves beholden to Sufi orders emerging from elsewhere, right? They had their own traditions of Walaya, and that's very clear if you read the Timbuktu Chronicles. There's um, references to Walaya, there's references to Ma'arifa, there's references even to Qutbaniya um, in the 16th century in, in Morocco, I mean, in Timbuktu, right? Um, so they have these pr prior understandings of, of, of um, Sufism, but not really associated with any uh, particular Sufi orders. Uh, arguably, that's because they don't feel the need to. Um, but with um, the Qadriya as taught by Mukhtar Kunti, uh, and with the, the Tijaniya, I think at this time is when they start um, seeing the um, advantages now of a more, um, uh, an, a, a more close affiliation with a, with a global Sufi network or the Sufi order. Um, and a lot of that had to do with you know, historical reasons in the 18th century um, in, in West Africa that are actually um, referenced um, social history, right? There, there's ways in which the clerical lineages, the scholarly lineages were finding themselves, um, you know, in need of breaking through uh, or uh, casting off old alliances with the Anshian regime, with the, with the kings of the past who were sometimes nominally Muslim, but because of the transatlantic slave trade had increasingly started to raid their own populations, including Muslim populations, right? So this is the background for the jihads that sweep through West Africa. And Sufi orders, namely the Qadiriya and the Tijaniya, are very instrumental um, in being able to make these authoritative claims against the kings that were there before, and also to unite followers across ethnic lines, which you know, previously scholars um, had found themselves kind of constrained within these clerical communities. So the kings had said, okay, fine, we're gonna give you land, you can teach Islam, but you gotta stay where you are, right? And don't mess with our authority. Uh, with the jihads, that starts to change. And the Suf, there's no accident then that the Sufi order has become coupled to the expressions of jihad from, you know, from the 18th century um, in West Africa. And so this is a, uh, the, really the engine by which the Sufi orders get known is uh, an actual uh, an internal revolution in West Africa that casts off, and one could argue is a result of the transatlantic slave trade, um, that casts off the what's seen as an oppressive monarchy and sets up a new political order. Um, and the Sufi orders are actually ways in which you can integrate large numbers of um, of peoples in, with, into these new communities, right? So colonial occupation really stops that in its tracks, but arguably the, the Muslims win the day and that the, the story of them winning that, that day is people like Shaykh Amadou Bamba, Shaykh Rami Yas, al Hajmarik Si that um, really constitute these new communities right under the noses of colonial occupation um, and make Islam and their Sufi orders the, the primary, you know, uh, expressions of, of, of self-worth and, of, um, and of, of community solidarities um, and, uh, in this, uh, in even an anti-colonial moment, right? Even a post-colonial movement also. So I know I've covered a lot of ground there, but there's a lot of pieces to that story why the Sufi orders and the Tijaniya in particular become very popular um, in 18th century, even though, or in the 19th century in West Africa, even though there hasn't there weren't really large scale um, uh, affiliations to Sufi orders prior to that time. MashaAllah, very beautiful. Uh, getting to, to, to the continuation of that uh, uh, Sufism in Africa, right? Uh, Sidi Ibrahim, there are a lot of people 
around the world that doesn't know much about the African Sufism. And uh, she, Zachary Wright had mentioned about uh, Ahmad Banba and uh, Ibrahim Yaz and also we know she Osman Fodio. Uh, what, you, what, you, what would you like to describe uh, to the world about this African Sufism heritage that we do not know much from it, but it has a very profound uh, heritage in terms of knowledge, Marifa, traditional Islam, yeah. I think uh, traditionally, the the Islamic world, I think the layman, as well as the, uh, the the scholarly world, has assumed that the intellectual Islam, the soul, uh, spirituality is confined only to the Arab Muslim world, which is a, which was a big mistake. Um, one of the driving forces behind our publishing of the books of the Tariq of Tijaniya, specifically from the community of the Feda, has to do with dispelling that myth, the myth that uh, Islam in all of its facets, Islam with regards to the Sharia, Islam with, with regards to uh, uh, the aspect of faith and Islam with regards to the at, uh, the aspect of uh, uh, spirituality or ihsan, maqam ihsan, um, that African uh, Islamic tradition has no real say there. Well, in fact, um, we have proven with just the publishing of a few titles, and inshallah, bringing out more titles like the Rimah, these types of books um, that the intellectual presence and the richness of, of literature and the richness of intellectual Islam, um, whether it's having to do with uh, the sciences, the Sharia, uh, the sciences of Tasawwuf, are actually one of the more uh, poignant and one of the more um, diverse, one of the more important and one of the more uh, 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 absolutely uh, amazing aspects of Islamic uh, intellectual studies. Um, and people just don't know. People, people assume that um, Islam in, in quote unquote black Africa has no real contribution or doesn't have a, an intellectual history. Um, and you know, one of the books that people constantly uh, return to me uh, discussing uh, about how amazing it is is the Kashful al Bas, which Fader Books did not originally publish, but which is a book that we took over the revised edition and published. And inshallah, uh, City of Zakaria Zachari will, will continue to revise and republish. Um, it's one of the most amazing books that proves the intellectual richness of Islam and, and all of its uh, dimensions. Um, so, faith, so part of our our mission is to bring that uh, that myth um, to a halt. The myth that uh, African Islam hasn't contributed and does not continue to contribute, uh, when in fact the the facts may uh, tell a, a completely different story. In that, uh, for for all intents and purposes, its contribution has been greater than any other intellectual. Uh, source from the other regions of the Islamic world. Thank you, uh, Sidi. Mashallah, beautifully said and explained. Right, uh, Sidi Talud, uh, you know, they always said that uh, this Tariqa Tijani, uh, Tarbiya, and so on. How, how would you describe all this stuff? Because they're saying that, oh, you, you in these difficult times uh, right now, especially now with lots of calamities and also people had no time at all time moved very fast especially in the city and they said that oh we can do khalwat we can do seclusion but at the same time this tariqa tijani has uh, something unique like from Sheikh Ibrahim yes, the tarbia and so on so how would you describe actually what is really tarbia what is really spiritual training because like you mentioned before that people now just going for spiritual blessing 
barakah. Right. So what is it that in this Tijani path that um, tarbiyah is something to be taken seriously and you are not in a state of seclusion also, right? So yeah, Imam. So um, I think there's uh, a few different questions. Um, uh, primarily, what what is the difference between tabarruk and tarabiya? What is the difference between just seeking blessing and tarabiya? Um, so the uh, the tijaniya, for example, uh, there's benefits to just loving Sidna Shaykh and then there's benefits to taking his wild you know and you know practicing his will and you know the these these are benefits that are promises you know from the prophet so you know uh, for example um if someone uh if someone loves Sheikh Ahmed Tijani and continues to love him until his, until he dies then you know he will he will be you know um he will die a believer and uh, you know that person is also promised wilaya, you know. And uh, if someone takes the weird, you know, then then he he's promised the fatul akbar before he passes away, you know. But you know the the being promised the fatul akbar before you pass away, you know this could come like you know a few moments before you pass away, and then you know you get the fatul akbar and then you're gone. You know this is not uh, this is this is. Uh, the extent of seeking baraka and the tariqa tijaniya. Um, seeking baraka in in uh, in general, uh, what it means it means a lot for different different turuk. So I, I can't say that this is a universal meaning, but in general, what people mean is that they they are connecting themselves to different awliya, you know, in order to be connected with them and to uh, be included in the statement you know, you are with those who you, who, who you love, you know, and so that would be uh, the extent of, uh, or the, the, the general intention behind seeking baraka. When one is seeking tarabiyah, then he is seeking to know Allah. And when we say we're seeking to know Allah, you know, um, the, the tarabiyah in, in reality has no end. So, um, you know, we have to we have to put that uh, into perspective because a lot of people, you know, I think the tarabiya is just what these dhikrs that that you know you get from your uh, from your muqaddam, and you know you you end it and you're you're finished, you know. Um, so knowing Allah is you know we, we seek to know Allah so that we 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 may worship Allah as He should be worshipped. And so uh, knowing Allah and worshiping Allah as he should be worshiped is the purpose of tarabiyah. And so for this, it requires um, certain, uh, certain uh, require, there are requirements over that of just seeking a path for, for, for uh, baraka. And so, because there, there are people who have, uh, who have sought the Tijani path for baraka and uh, it, it's not for that, so to speak, because in reality, the Tijani path is Tarabiya. Uh, the basis of uh, all of the, the shiyukh across all of their different um, traditions from, from the Tijaniya say that, you know, the, the basis of the Tarabiya is the five salats and at their proper time and doing the, the awrad al-lazima and then, and then, you know, filling your time with Salat al This is This is the basic Tarabiya of our path. And this can be done without, you know, without seclusion. Um, people, so seclusion was done in different ways throughout, you know, throughout history. Uh, people think, you know, seclusion has to be going into the desert and, you know, staying there for 40 years until you get the Fatul Akbar. And, you know, some people did it that way. In fact, you know, Sheikh Ahmed Tijani, he did Khalwa and Ayn in, um, in Madi, where he received the Fatul Akbar. You know, and so this is this is this is a practice of of, khal, of, of khalwa, um, but there's also a practice of khalwa um, for for your riyadat, which are your spiritual practices, and so you know that is that you in your home, or you know in your home, or or if you have access to it in another building, 
you set aside a room where that is your room where you will do all of your spiritual practices and you know you go there and you do your out for an hour and then you know that's your khalwa and then in the evening you go there and you do your out and that's your khalwa and then you know um and this is actually set down as a as a principle uh and or uh in the in one of the letters of Sheikh Ahmed the January that you set aside a, a time um, and every uh, two times in every day, or what is superior is to set aside three times in every day, once in the morning, once in the evening, and once in the middle of the night, where you turn to Allah completely, which he, and what he means is that you isolate yourself for a battle. And so, and it, it, this, this doesn't have to be a long time. <laughs> Um, you know, if, if you are only able to do 30 minutes in the, in the morning and 30 minutes in the evening, you know, then this this is complete. This is actually, you know, um, comp- this is actually, you know, included in this this type of uh, uh, khalwa, um, where you you isolate yourself for for certain parts of the day. You isolate yourself for worship, and so um, this is this is, you know, tarabia, um, and if you want to to know Allah, or you want to travel the path of knowing Allah, then there's tarabiyah, you know, that is tarabiyah uh, khasa, special tarabiyah. So we have, you know, muqaddams of general tarabiyah who are able to give the awrad, you know, and the awrad, you know, like Sheikh Mahi, um, in in a uh, in a live session a few weeks ago said the awrad the, the of this tijaniya are, are tarabiyya they are spiritual training you know however people only give what they have and so there are people who have the general tarabiyya of this, of this tariqa and then there are people who have special tarabiyya and Sheikh Ibrahim Niyaz was uh, not just one of the people who have special uh, tarabiyya but probably the the uh, the muqaddam of, of special tarabiyah who has had the most success in the history of Tijaniya, you know, and so um, and his and his special tarabiyah is to you know um, immerse the uh, is to immerse the the murid, you know, and dhikrs that will immerse him into the divine presence, and then to you know, um, while when he is in that presence, to direct his contemplation uh, towards what will give him understanding of those experiences, and so um, it involves special dhikrs and stuff like that. But you know, um, you do what you can. It's not something where you know um, this is law. You have to do this every day. Um, you know, you do what you can, and you know, like like they say. You know, Allah is the real murabbi. And so, you know, you won't get anything before Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, wills it. Oh, inshallah, uh, Imam, beautifully explain about this tarbiyah because I think sometimes people get confused what is tarbiyah. And uh, you, you, you define it and you explain it in detail, inshallah. I'm going to stick with you. Um, what was your view or what was your expectation or what's your opinion <laughs> uh, in regards that when Jawahir Ma'ani has been published, has been out thanks to Sidi Ibrahim, may Allah preserve him for this beautiful work um, and the world finally see the other sort of Sufism uh, uh, I would not say a different sort of Sufism because even we, you mentioned even our share my, uh, sorry Shaykh Ahmad Tijani and even Shaykh Ibrahim Nes also like to quote some of the Sufi from the past. But it is something sort of a different school of thoughts, not like what people have been used to, right? So, w- what do people expect from it and what sort of difference in, in, in that particular books and way of tariqa? Yeah. So, um... I think uh, the intention that the author um, or the compiler mentioned in, in the introduction to Jawahir Ma'ani is key uh, to what you can expect in Jawahir Ma'ani. 
And so um, the primary intention of uh, Sidi Ali Harazm it was to uh, inspire the Murids, you know, um, to be uh, spurred on to travel the path of Sidna Sheikh Radiallahu to inspire them and give them energy, you know, to seek out, you know, what they are missing, you know, in the path, you know, and to seek out, you know, these spiritual experiences, the spiritual knowledge um, that is available through the wellspring of Sidna Sheikh Radiallahu Anhu. And so, um, and the first volume deals mostly with the biography, um, which I, I think that um, Sidi Zakaria's book is, is a great uh, complement for that. Um, it deals mostly uh, with the biography of Sidna Sheikh Radiallahu Anhu, but it does, it does give a, uh, an explanation of his philosophy on the Sheikh and the Murid, and um, and also his philosophy on um, on different things on the Ismail and, uh, and 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 um, and the the the, uh, the rewards of different different our art. Um, so uh, it, the first volume, uh, what you should come away with, is a uh, a renewed and invigorated love of the Sheikh Radiyallahu because you see. Um, his uh, complete adherence to the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to the point that you know he he you know um, Sidi Ali Harazm he, he's so Sidi Ali Harazm you have to um, put his book into respect perspective of he had, he was somebody he was a murid who had perfect adab uh, perfect adab with the, the maqam of his sheikh perfect adab with you know um, when mentioning his sheikh and so. Uh, that that Sidi uh, Zach, Zachary he, he mentions that the maqam of Qutb al Maktoum, you know, and even Khatmiyah is only alluded to in the in the Jawad al-Mani. It's never is never actually mentioned. And um, to me, that that uh, speaks more to the adab of Sidi Ali Harazm of not not mentioning specifically. What the Sheikh has not given him permission to, to mention specifically, and so he, you know, he was like the the uh, the idea of the perfect murid, you know, and uh, and and in our our time, an example of that would be Sayyid, Sayyid Ali Sisi, who you know um, who only mentioned he he, he was a complete khadim uh, uh, khadim of of, uh, of Sheikh Ibrahim Yash, whatever you know. He didn't you know he didn't go beyond what his sheikh told him to do, and he didn't fail in what his sheikh wanted from him. And so, um, and he showed perfect adab with the sheikh. But, uh, you know, this if, if we want to see an example of, of what I'm talking about, then say the IDCC, and how he interacted with um, Sheikh Ibrahim Yashwara, you know, I know, which you can still get, uh, you can still learn from people who are living today, then that's an example of, of this perfect adab that I'm speaking about. And so, you know, to the, the, back to the point about, you know, uh, Sidna Sheikh following the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to the point that he would correct scholars who he saw doing something that, you know, may have been, you know, um, may not have been haram, but may have been um, what they call in, in, in fiqh terms, not the best thing to do. And so, and how he would re correct them and say, um, uh, has that been narrated in the Sunnah? You know, and he would correct even the, you know the the scholars. You know, see the Ali Harazm doesn't say scholars. He says, you know, if it's someone who has some knowledge of the Sunnah or someone who should know better, then he says that you know. But he you know he's talking about you know scholars because that's who Sidna Sheikh Rabi Alawani was was actually dealing with. You know, um, so that. The um, the reality is that you know if you go to Jawad al as a as a Tijani, then you know I hope that from the first volume you will come come away with a renewed and invigorated love of the Sheikh and a renewed and invigorated love uh, understanding of you know his philosophy on, on Tariqa and his philosophy on 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 the Sheikh and Murid and uh, understanding of, of uh, where, where his awrad, uh, the, the, the obligatory awrad 
of the uh, Jania fit in with all of these different zikrs that that we see that 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 come from different shiurs and different different turu, and where they are situated. Um, that's that will get the, the first volume, inshallah, will, will give you you know this understanding. Um, when you come to you know the Jawad Mani in general, what's because it's the, the first volume is only a, 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 the the first half really. Um, when it comes to the, the sections on that on his transmitted knowledge, then you know it it it, it may surprise you actually um, because it, he speaks on a variety of different matters um, and. He, you know, he, he refers to, you know, different different shiuf of the past, but he he places their their thinking and their thoughts, and he also places their philosophies into a very systematic uh, understanding uh, and a very uh, systematic hierarchy of where uh, of where the, the knowledge came from and what the not and what the purpose of the knowledge is, and so you know he, he's very specific on the limits of. Uh, of uh, scholastic theology, for example, um, he's very specific on the limits of that, and where certain um, opinions and scholastic theology uh, have gone gone away from that limit, and so he brings it back to where the limit should be. Um, and in terms of uh, you know tafsir of Quran, you know he transmits some uh, opinions which you know um, scholars before him. Had considered, you know, um, not not shad, but not, you know, not the mainstream opinion. Um, one of those is uh, is regarding the esma of, of the prophets, alayhi wasalam, and you know how that plays into certain things uh, within the Quran. Um, for example, uh, the Quran, you know, he said uh, the Quran says about, you know. Yusuf alayhi salam that you know uh, that the wife of the wazir inclined towards him and he inclined towards her, and so Sidna Sheikh radi Allah and we put that that into into perspective, you know of you know where the humanity of the prophets has a sort of interplay with their isma, you know where they they are not their humanity, you know um, or their human nature does not contradict the human nature of all human beings, so to speak. And so um, he, he puts that into a nice perspective of how we can understand, you know, the, the human nature of the Prophet Wasallam, and also understand their isma. And I think that's really, really important. Um, and this will, inshallah, um, be in the second volume, um, the, the, this, uh, this discussion. But I think it's very important in a, in a time where uh, people go from between extremes, um, especially uh, in the West, we're, we're exposed mostly to the Diobandi and, and uh, Bradley divide um, in terms of, of traditional um, Islam. That's what we're, we're mostly exposed to. And so you have you know, the, the people who argue a, a almost superhuman prophet um, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, was superhuman. And so, you know, they say that certain things can't affect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because that would, you know, affect, you know, his perfection. And what they're really referring to is the reality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is a separate matter. And, you know, so reading, you know, the, the, the text uh, that Sheikh, Sheikh Ahmed Zian Raleigh on his, his explanations will bring that into perspective of how the Prophet ﷺ has this untouched and immaculate reality that has no comparison and is not changed and is not affected by any of these, any of the the um, the, the uh, accidental causes in creation. And then you have the Prophet ﷺ who is a human, a human being and has and is affected, you know, by you know the, the 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 reality or the 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 world in which he lives, and so that is, is, that feeds into you know people who, when the Prophet says you know that women were made appealing to him out of this 
out of out of this creation. You know, they say, oh, you know, he, he's referring to something else or some hidden reality in women. No, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, he was a human being. And so, and and out of all of the things that human beings desire, you know, there were certain things that Allah, you know, allowed his his or actually instilled in him because if his reality were were made to to uh, to overcome his humanity, then we wouldn't be able to relate to him, you know. And so, uh, the, these understandings come from reading what Sidna Shaykh Radiallahu was saying, what he's transmitting. And a lot of time he's transmitting from, from other, you know, Mufassirin who um, may, their opinions have been, kind of been discarded or put to the side by the mainstream Mufassirin. But it, it puts into perspective, you know, that the fact that, you know, he was wide read because you, you know, unless you, you know, had a wide reading of Tafsir, you don't know most of these uh, these these opinions, you know, because in the 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 tafsirs like you know that that are mainly studied in West in West Africa, North Africa, you know, they only deal with the mainstream opinions, you know, they don't deal with you know outside opinions that that may have been discarded by the mainstream opinions, and so the, you know when you when you read throughout the Mahani, you know the the you you will fall in love with this man who. Uh, was, you know, in his time, you know, he was, uh, you know, uh, completely, you know, and utterly immersed in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also, this, he was a, a erudite scholar who was very keenly aware of literature in his time and the literature that came before him. Allah, thank you very much, uh, Allah. Uh, getting to Shay Zikri right uh, in regards to the Prophet Sallallahu which MashaAllah Imam Talud mentioned right there is also a myth in the Tariqat Tijani that or a wild thing to say that uh, someone accused of saying that uh, Salat Fatih is better than anything else or even better than uh, reading on the Quran for example so uh, how authentic is this to debunk all this myth and also accusation and all that stuff? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think uh, Imam Dalud could also speak to this, but you know, Shah Majani uh, effectively addresses this in Duarimani itself. And he says basically that there are different classes of people who read the Quran. And he says, for the Arif Billah, the Gnostic, the consummate Gnostic, then of course nothing is better than the Quran. Um, and, you know, I should also back up by saying that it's like comparing apples and oranges, right? It's like saying what's better, um, um, giving sadaqah or giving zakat? Well, you can't compare the two, right? Because zakat is obligatory and sadaqah is not, right? <laughs> right? Um, the reading of the Quran is obligatory. Shamajani affirms that, right? It's incumbent upon you according to the Sharia, right? And we know that the Tijani disciples um, generally have been encouraged to read one juz of the Quran every day. Uh, and the great Qabr uh, of this Tariqa, the great Sheikhs of this Tariqa have done more than that. Um, uh, so the Quran is extremely important um, and you can't leave, uh, you can't leave it as a matter of the Sharia. Salat al fati is something that despite its immense um, benefit is something that you can take or leave. You don't have to recite Salat al fati um, And so, but Shaykh Amajani, he does say from the perspective of somebody, uh, and this was emphasized in, uh, when Sheikh Hassan Sisi, when he explained this to me, many years ago, he said, you know, there are some, uh, there are some cases in which um, um, the Quran, if you're not acting according to what the Quran is telling you to do, uh, because the Quran is either a witness for you or against you, that the Quran itself can be cursing you, right? If you are a person lying and the Quran says, don't lie, and you're reading the Quran, <laughs> then the Quran is actually cursing you for the thing that you're doing. But he said, Shaykh Hassan said, there's no narration in which any form of Salat al Nabi, prayer upon the Prophet, is ever cursing its reciter. So in those cases, then, yes, prayer, any form of prayer upon the Prophet, say some, is better for them. If they're not acting according to what the Quran is saying to do, um, then 
uh, in terms of um, uh, reward, then the then the prayer upon the prophet is is more appropriate for them. Um, so just to say that it's a, a question of apples and oranges, and I think that's the best way to answer it. I just wanted to speak to what um, Imam Talud was saying, some of the very important points he was making. Um, and I think, you know, I think those of us have work in the field with the, 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 um, the text of the Tijaniya uh, have kind of come to grips with this um, uh, paradox in a way. And, and one of the, you know, basically the, the, the kind of rush and the, the beauty of these texts, right? And you want to get them out and you want to share them. And as Imam Talud says, when you read this uh, Juwahir Mani, or you really come to grips with the with the actual teachings of Shah Matijani, then you if, if your heart is sincere, then you can't help but fall in love with, with this Sheikh. Um, and I would also, you know, kind of push it a bit further. Um, uh, uh, Imam Dulu had uh, uh, references in passing, but I, I would say the deep metaphysical remunerations of of the Juwahir al-Mani, right? I mean, when Shah Matijani talks about the Araf Bilah being uh, harf min haruf Allah. I mean, that's right. He, that the Gnostic is a letter from among the letters of God. I mean, this is fascinating stuff, right? When he talks about the four different types of thoughts, right? You have thoughts from Allah, thoughts from the angels, thoughts from your nafs, and thoughts from shaitan. Like, th those are deep metaphysical, I would even call it philosophy, right? That people um, from many, um, uh, from a wider readership, whether they're Muslim or not, to be honest, would would be interested in, right? I mean, effectively, he's saying that in, uh, a Gnostic can see the whole universe in code, like, like in the, the movie, The Matrix, right? <laughs> it's interesting stuff. Um, but on the other hand, is that this, um, these conversations, and I, and, and I really understand, and I, I agree with why Imam Talud is really emphasizing tarbiya and the, the ongoing need for a sheikh, right? Because, um, and, and I think what we're um, sort of witnessing right now in the English language is what was witnessed in the Tariqa among Arabic speakers right around the turn of the century, of the turn of the 20th century, when a lot of the Tijani literature moved from manuscript form and got printed. Um, and this, I think one of the first printings of the Juwahir is in 1900, for example. Um, and, you know, people were conflicted, right? Some of the Tijani scholars said, no, absolutely, Juwahir Mani should not be published, right? Um, and, you know, eventually it, it did get published anyway. Um, and essentially their concern was that people would be reading texts um, or taking texts as sheikhs instead of living exemplars of, of that tradition, right? And I think you know, by and large, the Islamic scholarly tradition has been unanimous in this, right? Ibn Jama'a, for whatever science, right? For, for whatever discipline. Ibn Jama'a, uh, he says the great 13th century Syrian scholar, he says, the greatest calamity is to take a text instead of a sheikh, right? right? Um, and there are things in the Jawahir um, you know, if you, if you, can take it out of context. Like he, he's making these allusions to the different prayers like Darat al Ahata, right? And he's talking about, this is actually where the conversation about the, the different names of the secret names of everything in creation. Like if you know that name, the secret name of something, you know it's code, in other words, you can, you can influence or exert the athir on that, on that thing. Um, uh, Right, and, and so, but this comes in a conversation of this secret prayer, which he doesn't actually talk about, right? Um, now th th that, and, and, and elsewhere he talks about a, a secret name that's specific to Ali ibn Abi Talib. But if you read that out of context, you think that, um, you know, that the Tijaniya has uh, overlooked the value of the other Sahaba, right? Um, but if you understand it in context, right, where, of, of that particular prayer, right, um, which has allusion to the secret names of all of the four Khulafa Rashidun, right, um, and the four archangels. I mean, so these are like layers and layers of discussion. That's what I'm, I'm just pointing to. I'm trying to reveal secrets, of course, but um, uh, that there are layers and layers of understandings that can only really be situated for you. Um, that the sheikh in the, in the text is speaking to these multiple layers simultaneously. 
and you need a living exemplar to sort of um, not be, um, you know, it's good to read, right? But in terms of actually inputting a lot of this into practice, um, these texts were meant to be read in the presence of sheikhs. Yeah. So that's a, um, I, I like to say. Um, I, I just want, I know we're um, extending long, but I just wanted to say very quickly, um, one of the, the, the kind of place where we are right now in terms of this vast new and fate of books has really been instrumental in this. Sautalahi has also been instrumental. Um, uh, if you look on, um, uh, so we've constituted what we're calling a Tijani Research Council. Um, it numbers no fewer, I think, than 30 people around the world that are doing active research on the Tijania. Um, that's really fascinating, right? Um, uh, and it kind of points to the idea that research now is a much more collaborative uh, mindset, right? Um, so if we're not careful, we're going to end up, re you know, there's, there's going to be two people trying to translate Bugit and Mustafid at the same time when really we could be collaborating on this. And that's one of the things I was most proud about with Kashf al is that we were able to get a team of people together and not only the ones that were listed on the translation, but many others also um, to participate in that. And I know Imam Dalud has also, um, I know, although his name is singularly on the Dua'i Mani, I know he also involved a larger discussion. And I think that's to all of our benefits. So, um, you know, we have this really interesting thing going on right now. We have a flood of literature on the Tijaniya um, being produced and it's being consumed all over the world. Let's face it, the Tijaniya now is not just in African Durika, right? It's in Turkey, it's in Albania, it's in Pakistan, it's in India, it's in uh, yeah. Indonesia. Um, it's everywhere. And that's also face it that the, the, the majority language that most Muslims in the world speak today is not Arabic, right? Um, right? It's important to learn Arabic, but the majority language that most people are consuming uh, their knowledge about Islam, most Muslims, is English. Um, so we're in this really fascinating time in which there's a flood of literature being produced. Um, and yet uh, we still want, you know, many of us that are producing this literature still want to point or emphasize the kind of traditional um, aspect that true knowledge, right, is to be have to is to be attained in, in the presence of a of a of a person of the person. You get knowledge from person to person transmission, not from a text itself. Um, uh, and so, you know, one of the ways I think that we can um, sort of guide that conversation going forward is to think about this more kind of collaborative work, to be in closer, you know, uh, we as researchers and as publishers to be in closer conversation with the, the audience that's reading these books, right? What are the books that they really want to, to know about? And so that's, um, you know, we've just launched a, a new website called the Tijani Literature Online Project, um, tijani.org. If I can share my screen, I'll show it very quickly. Um, and so you can get a sense of, you know, what there is here. You can see um, the Research Council. Um, many of you are, are, are listed there. Um, and this is basically a means by which we, we hope to sort of coordinate these academics and lay audience. I think this panel is a really good example of what, you know, the kind of where we should be, what we should be doing, right? We have, you know, in other words, academic researchers, practitioners, um, publishers, all in a conversation together, right? So that none of us is sort of out in the left field producing something that uh, other, I'm namely speaking to academics here, <laughs> they're not producing something in which the practitioners themselves don't find their own voice, right? Um, and then, you know, I think, yes, yeah, so we have multimedia, the Tijani library is a, is a really good resource here where we can, um, you know, you can have direct access to Arabic primary source material. We hope that more uh, translations will be available here, probably in uh, collaboration with Fatal Books. Uh, we have articles which are not normally, um, you know, um, available for a lot academic art articles are kind of hard to find unless you have a university login, but here are a lot of them that are associated with Tijenia, some of the manuscripts also, some of the foundational reference works here. Um, so uh, we hope that this can, you know, be, I, this is not just this um, notion of a, of a academic or a researcher in a dusty library producing uh, literature all by himself or herself, 
uh, to be consumed by a nameless audience. This is an idea of a collaborative workspace, um, uh, much closer um, uh, interaction with, with uh, readership and the producers um, to kind of produce a more authentic conversation. And this is an, a conversation, of course, that we don't have to worry about if it's between scholars and their students in, in real time, in physical space, in physical proximity, right? But because now we are admitting that we're in digital space, like we're having, we're all over the world right now. Right? We're having a conversation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and many of us, many people who take Aturika or, or even a Muslim do not have a, a chance to study for years, let alone months or even weeks with a licensed scholar, right? They're getting their knowledge in different ways. So we have to um, kind of think about how we can produce communities um, in new digital spaces that are still authentic, even if we are still pointing back to the importance of actual physical companionship. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, so beautiful. Uh, anyway, we're already near to two hours, MashaAllah. There's so much to talk about. But then I think time doesn't permit us. And uh, I think we learned so much today from our three blessed guests. So uh, before we end, uh, I, I just like to ask uh, maybe Sidi Ibrahim, if you have any last word that you'd like to share with the audience, watch, with the viewers watching live right now? Uh, what I would like to share is exactly, I would like to echo actually what uh, my brother Sidi Ustaz Zakaria just mentioned the Tijani.org project. It's, uh, it's very, very important. Uh, despite uh, the Tijani Atarika arguably being the largest, perhaps in the world, with regards to its uh, membership, um, we have quite a bit more to do uh, when it comes to, to propagating the Tariqa through the literature specifically. And, and I like the emphasis he made because this is a question that I get often. I get uh, dozens and dozens of emails a day with regards to um, the, the literature that we publish and we produce being in and of itself enough for a seeker as opposed to having to sit, quote unquote, at the feet of the scholars. I like uh, Siddi Zakaria's um, answer to that in that by no means uh, is that the intention uh, you know it's uh it's just an assistance but the true goal is to get the understanding from the sheikh and the muqaddam but what i will say is we must emphasize that the tijani.org project is finally uh, a source with which people can get a much more concise understanding and and better look at the different sources, the literature, the academic uh, uh, works that have been produced. Um, because oftentimes these, these works are available, but they're difficult to access, or they're, they're in, obscure, in a type of obscure type of situation academically. Now it's open to the general public, and I would emphasize and encourage everyone to support it, visit the site, um, send us your, your comments, your questions, and ho hopefully with the assistance of, of, of our beloved brother Khaled and Sutlai, we'll be able to do more of these types of uh, engagements and talks in the digital sphere um, so that people from all over the world can benefit from scholars like uh, Professor Zakaria and Imam Talu, inshallah. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm in no way in the league of our uh, esteemed scholars. Um, I'm just their, their, their servant. Uh, and it's a service that I'm very proud of. Um, these two Mashallah. brothers I've known for some time and uh, they are wonderful. Um, and the service you're doing, Sidi Khalid, Sutilahi, is absolutely unique. And I encourage everyone to support as well. Adakallah. Uh, thank you, Sidi Ibrahim, mashallah. We're looking forward to work on the tijani.org and may Allah make it successful and accept it. Now we go Amen. to uh, Imam Talud. If you have anything to say, to share with us before we end this? Yeah. Uh, um, 
I, I, I think uh, you know, she's exactly uh, um, he covered most most of everything. Um, uh, the most important things. Uh, the I just like to add that you know, um, Alhamdulillah, you know, Allah has given us you know um, a a manner and a way of, of doing khidma to this tariqah and his people. Um, but uh, you know, if, if you know, if you enjoy the works, you know, um, and you know, you you enjoy the work that people like uh, Sidi Khalid are doing. Uh, if you're interested in the work that um, the the initiative that Sidi Zachary has started, uh, if you're interested in seeing more, you know, translations, then then support, you know, and in, in whatever way you can support, you know, if there's a book out. You know, help help get the word out that is out. You know, to to other than you know just our community because you know it, it uh, you know the the work you know it, it's not you know it's not uh, we don't lose anything doing the work, but you know it does it, it does take you know um, time and money to produce you know. Um, uh, the the amount of money that went into you know producing Jawad and Maani is 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 a lot. <laughs> uh, the, the amount of the amount of money that has gone into producing several works that are, that are in, that are going to be coming out is a lot. And uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, you know there are people who uh, who actually uh, you know they spent money on these things, you know, and they they helped out. But you know. Um, it, it it also needs support, you know, through through buying the books. You know, I know uh, Sidi Zachary, you know, he put his book out, you know, in PDF form, you know, and, and for free. But if you can, you know, get the get the uh, the print edition also. I know you, you. I don't have to say that to the bookworms out there, but uh, you know, um, there there are people. You know, if if you want to support, you know, then then you know, buy the books, inshallah, buy the books. Allah, may Allah preserve you, uh, Talud. Uh, Imam Talud uh, have online dars uh, with us in Singapore at South Lake like Facebook live like this on every Saturday 12 uh, p.m. Singapore time 12 p.m. So you have to minus your, your local time, and it's uh, by Sheikh Al Arab Ibn Sa'eh book. And we've been going for I think three months, right, Imam? Inshallah. Uh, just before Ramadan, I believe. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So Inshallah, Alhamdulillah, may Allah preserve him. So, uh, is that right? Any last word you'd like to share with us? Um, yeah. Well, just you know, I'm really honored to be part of this um, an intellectual community that spans um, you know universities and outside of universities. Um, I think it's really important for. Um, conversations to keep going. Um, I really do um, support what Imam Talud has said. You know, I would just say, yeah, I, I did make, uh, you know, the, my publisher, the UNC Press, I'll, I'll share the book cover right now, uh, Realizing mm -hmm. Islam, um, the Tijaniya North African 18th Century Muslim World is available for free download uh, PDF. Uh, that's supported by a Mellon Foundation grant that the publisher, University of North Carolina, press got, and the, I think the tune is about $7,000. So I just want to make the point that that's probably what a publisher goes in for to publish each one of these books, right? I'm not a publisher myself, but um, so, you know, that's not going to be made back, uh, will barely be barely made back if they sell out all of the print run, right? So you really, I think it, it is, I consider, you know, my own obligation, if there's a book that I that somebody has published that's relevant to me, that I buy that book um, because it's something that, you know, if, if, if the larger community does not do it and is just looking for pirated PDFs online, uh, then the work can't go on, right? It can't be, can't be produced and scholars can't be, um, you know, I'm, I'm lucky I'm in a university, so I don't, you know, I have a job that, I don't, uh, that allows me to, to write and to research um, and I don't have to, I don't, I don't, you know, make money from from public publishing books, but um, you know, for the most people who do write in this way, they that's their that's their income, and uh, yeah. So, so yeah. Thanks anyway for for all of you guys. You know, 
I'm preaching to the choir, of course, but all of you guys that support us and that are part of this conversation, really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Shade Agri, for sharing with us and also I mean, a lot of peace of you. I think before I end, uh, I'd like to make a, uh, one announcement about the hospital project, humanitarian project run by Shea Mahi under Alfia Tiano. Uh, we like you to urge you, those who are watching, if you like to contribute at any amount. We have been doing this for three years. The hospital is for humanity purpose and humanitarian, it's a humanitarian project and purpose. It's been ongoing for three years, as I mentioned, and it's been uh, it's at uh, Taibanias. So uh, if you're interested, it's uh, under launchgoodbit.ly slash Senegal Hospital. Or you can go to Sawilahi Facebook or IG. I repeat again, it's at uh, the launch good. You can donate at any amount or contribute at any amount. It's at uh, bit.ly slash Senegal Hospital. All right. Uh, before we end this and closing up, um, can uh, either she exactly right or Imam Talut make the closing door? Yeah, uh, well, we just want to thank, we thank, uh, we thank Allah, we thank the creation for uh, helping us in this endeavor. Uh, we're just going to recite Salat al Fatih. Imam, you have to recite with me also, Sri Ibrahim and uh, Khalid. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al Fatih, Imam al Khatim, Imam al Sabak, Nasr al Hakim al Hakim al Hadi, Ila Sarat al Muslim. With this, uh, we'd like to say thank you to all of you. May Allah preserve all of you. Uh, we hope to see all of you again on our uh, live, inshallah. And remember us in your prayer. Alhamdulillah, that was a very interesting and beneficial uh, session that we had. Uh, it's actually our podcast, but we make it live on uh, Shama Tijani and the Tijaniya Sufi Order. So much to learn, mashallah. May Allah bless our guests. I'd just like to update you for this Saturday and Sunday. We'll be having the Blessed Tree screening again. On this Saturday, we have it at uh, 15 August. Uh, 10 p.m. and on Sunday, 16 August or 9 a.m. This is to ensure that people around the globe, wherever you are, able to watch this beautiful documentary. And on Sunday, inshallah, our Tafsir Quran Sheikh Ibrahim Nas with Imam Abdul Andaw will continue, inshallah. And with this, we say a good night, good evening, good morning, and uh, good times for all of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our Ibadah and Tawbah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.